Well, good evening, dear friends um, and fans of our lecture series. I'm very glad to see you, despite the numbers are rising, 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 and I'm very glad to see here our guest physically, Matteo Kainer. So it's a uh, really pleasure to see you here physically. Um, and uh, I'm happy to welcome you to the third lecture of uh, this year open lecture series organized by the Faculty of Architecture of Estonian Academy of Arts, supported by Cultural Endowment of Estonia. Matteo Kainer is a practicing architect, curator and educator based in London and Milan he is a principal of Matteo Kainer Architecture since 2010 um, and after receiving his master's degree from the University of Architecture in Venice, he worked and collaborated with a number of celebrated international practices including Peter Eisenman in New York, Kopp Himmelblau in Vienna and Arata Isosaki Associate in uh, Milan. In uh, 2004, uh, he was assistant director for the Ninth International Architecture Biennale Metamorph. In 2006, curator of uh, the London Architecture Biennale Change, and in 2018, curator of the Dark Side Club in Venice. Very interesting club, I have to say. Yeah. Hmm. Well, um, I don't know, never know. <laughs> In 2011, kind of moved to Paris, where he was associate professor and director of the Ecole Especiale d'Architecture. During this time, he created and uh, directed the Pavillon Especial series. And it was also in Paris that he conceived and hosted Architecture Whispers. And uh, in 2013, co-founded and co-directed with Odile Tech, the uh, Confluence Institute for innovation and creative strategies in architecture in Lyon. In 2018, he moved back to London and uh, was uh, nominated curator for the seventh edition of the Dark Side Club for the International Architecture Biennale in Venice. Two times. Mm. Today, he remains a regular visiting critic um, at both in Westminster and the AA in March 2020 uh, to respond to the pandemic. Uh, he launched MCA Online, uh, a free educational initiative to provide lectures, teaching, and support to uh, homebound students. And at the end of the year, he opened MCA in Milan, Italy. The uh, work of uh, Matteo and his practice has won various awards and has been published in numerous books and international magazines. It has also been featured in various international exhibitions, among uh, which the Royal Academy in London and the Peace Architecture Biennale. Uh, Matteo has also lectured and written and edited a number of books and articles in the field of architecture and design, and his studio featured in num numerous books, international magazines, and was selected as one of the 25 five significant emerging international practices at the London Architecture Festival. So please join me welcoming Matteo Kainer. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's going to, uh, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit more about the story. First of all, Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Sile, for inviting me to, let's say, show a little bit of the work and the research that the practice has done, especially uh, with the title of Healing Architecture, which I think could not be more fitting in the times that uh, we're living in. So um, I've structured the lecture, let's say, in three parts, but it's much more of a triptych. Uh, so everything is correlated and everything is woven together. And um, it deals with multiple parts of the practice, not only the practice, curatorial, the academic, and the research. Um, and this is because the work and the research theorizes and speculates on much broader issues that are, uh, that are core to the practice. But um, let's start with the title of the lecture. <laughs> uh, 
alphabetizing the matrix of discomfort. When I sent it over, I got quite a lot of question marks uh, asking me what it was about. So I decided that I wanted to, um, let's say, give you two possible reading keys into this. Um, one is the idea of breaking down of, uh, let's say, uh, understanding and identifying into much smaller, smaller parts like an alphabet, um, the discomfort uh, and the matrix. I, what I mean by the matrix is your actual behavior, your behavioral patterns and how this, let's say, popular ethos has brought about discomfort in certain people. The second part is much more, let's say, active and it's, it's reacting and a consequence to the first. And what I mean by that is that what is, um, how can you hack your own personal uh, matrix to, uh, to start to uh, have different behavioral patterns, let's say a different alphabet of behavior. And I think that that is very important because we need to be able to, uh, to be agents of change, right? We need to understand that our behavior is consequential to what is happening. Um, and to that, I want to bring uh, to, the, uh, to the table uh, David Quoman. This book was written in 2012. And as you can see, um, he's talking about uh, the, the human pandemic and the animal infectious and the human pandemic. And what he says is that if we're able to cure and get out of COVID because of will or because of ingenuity, we can celebrate for five minutes, but then we need to get back to it immediately. And this is something which for me uh, is, is very important because I think we need to realize uh, that we're not just living in a pandemic, we're living in a syndemic. And what do I mean by that? Uh, this is, uh, it's a synergy of epidemics, but the real answer to, to the question, what is a syndemic, is that um, the context is really key. Everybody's always talking about the idea that the epidemic doesn't look in the face of any, anybody, but it's just the opposite. In reality, the pandemic has uh, affected and has, has highlighted the differences that have happened between structural violence, uh, between uh, health, between poverty. All these are actually fertile territory for the pandemic to happen. So it's not that one says, we haven't done anything in the pandemic just happened. And especially the book that we're talking about, we're becoming much closer by deforestation to animals that we were not close enough before. So it's a different kind of pandemic and right now it's called uh, a syndemic. Um, but this means that there needs to be, uh, uh, something needs to happen, we need to change, right? So. And I was thinking that, of course, during the pandemics, uh, there were there was always have been changes, right? So if we think about it, um, during the cholera and the typhoid, the sewage systems, the embankment, um, of course, Green Park in New York, and then we have, uh, of course, Paris and the boulevards. So there's all the pandemic has always be, uh, been, let's say, a catalyst for change, and one that. Uh, can offer an, an opportunity, uh, and an opportunity to create change, right? So uh, the thing that, that I wanted uh, when, when, when I was looking at this and, and I realized it, I said, you know, we need to have a call for action, right? And that's when I started, as, as it was introduced, um, this uh, initiative, which was called MCA Online. And MCA Online was, I decided to go online quite at the beginning of 2020 uh, and to give uh, free lectures, they were called the Tenso Lectures, and to actually talk to the students and uh, do crits just online. And it was really very interesting and overwhelming because of course I had people from all over the world that would call and write emails and say, can we do a crit? So I saw, I saw projects and everything from all over. And what I came to realize was that uh, a lot of the students had been asked to specifically, you know, finish their studies and graduate and enter the working world from their room. And so I thought, well, you know, I mean, seriously, if I thought of when I was at university, when I finished university, graduation, everything, I mean, 
it was a celebratory moment, and this was de definitely not what was happening. So I thought, well, maybe I should give them a voice. Maybe I should give them a stage uh, to do something. Uh, and so that's when I came up with uh, this initiative, um, which was called What Now? and uh, post-COVID-19. And it was an open call to graduate students of 2020 to sketch a project. I asked them specifically to sketch a project uh, that would uh, you know, uh, kind of imagine an extraordinary world. But not just, let's say, how the world was changing around them, but specifically how they wanted to change. So this initially started uh, as, uh, let's say, as uh, something for the graduates. Um, and I, like I was saying, it was uh, what now and post-COVID-19. Um, but it was part of a much bigger event, which is called Alphabet for the Future. That's why I'm also talking about alphabetizing the matrix of discomfort. And so this is um, what is really interesting. It's that I wanted to create a foundation, a new vocabulary um, of ideas one that is uh, more environmental, egalitarian, generous, and human-centric. And so this is actually part of an exhibition and a book that we're working on where we've asked various architects, designers, fashion designers, graphic designers. It's been in the making for quite a long time, um, but it's a book that I, I want it to be really something like a new vocabulary, something that you can see at this moment in time, like a seismograph, what is happening. And what is happening through sketches, right? Because I think that the sketch can convey certain ideas much faster, much better than a completed project. I mean, if we think about uh, uh, about Jonah Friedman and the Ville Spatiale, how it dealt with uh, the problematics of, of housing, or Antonio Santelia, how he was uh, the precursor of and what defined the city of the 21st century, or of course, we have Archie Zoom, Archie Graham, and uh, Paolo Sorleri that went against the status quo. So. I mean, the sketch is something which is extremely interesting, and it's extremely interesting also for me. Um, and I, w I need to open a small parenthesis because I think it's always interesting to see where certain ideas come from. Because I'm right now we're in 2020, but this started quite earlier, meaning that I started focusing on the sketch in the Biennale in 2006, okay? So it's a process that is evolving. And I thought it would be interesting for you to see how the process comes through. And, and this was when I asked various uh, international architects from all over the world, there were 90, and, and I asked them to sketch, um, let's say, a vision for, uh, for the city of London, an outsider's view. Um, and what was really interesting is that they came back with quite a lot of ideas. and. Uh, and these became kind of beacons. This was the installation design and the actual exhibition. We had 90 architects, and each one created a kind of sketch of how they saw uh, the, the, the city change and what were the potentials uh, for that. Um, but the whole idea of the sketch was also to go beyond cyberspace and video simulation and all this parade of images and to actually go back to the essence, right? To the essence of, of what, are th what are the ideas? That's why I'm always talking about the sketch and how the sketch can connect to that. And I think that this is something which is, uh, which is extremely important. Um, and I wanted to, to just um, show you this image because I think it's very um, telling of how I've structured the lecture. It's a little bit like the movie Inception where you're gonna have to pay quite a lot of attention because I'm gonna go back and forwards in time and try to layer various parts because like I was telling you at the beginning, it's a triptych, but it's all interlaced one into another. And I think that um, to do that, I want to start with um, the research that is done uh, that is done by the office because the research is let's say one of the parts uh, of the office is something that continuously influences contaminates and evolves the work of the office um, and in that sense I will I will explain uh, the three kind of thematics that we are addressing because um, it, it's the one that keeps you 
uh, keeps you updated, keeps you in current with what is happening around uh, the world and what are really global issues. And that's why I was saying today, even when we were doing some of the crits, that the research is extremely important because it's not just re research on the site, it's really understanding the context and what is happening around you. Because like I said at the beginning, we need to be agents of change and to do that, we need to actually know what is happening, right? And I have always quote Hans Hollein because architecture is everything. It's not just one part. There's multiple parts in it, and it's important to start seeing it that way, that as architects, you're not just architects. You're able to bring change, right? So change both behaviorally, socially, uh, and collectively. So the first one that I want to talk about is uh, converging ecologies. This is much more, let's say, environmental, and it's the, it's the idea of working with nature, meaning designing with and for nature, right? And it doesn't mean just the usual greenwashing that when you're uh, working with, uh, let's say, nature. It actually means working with the elements, working with the sun, the wind, the, the shadows, uh, the, I mean, the water. Each of these can become elements which are uh, inherent in the project and are intrinsic to the project. Therefore, making nature, not only seeing the potential of nature in your projects, but specifically in the idea that it can become a protagonist and it can have center stage in your way of living architecture. The second one is instead resilient adaptive reuse. Now, this is the idea of how you can uh, work with history and desire. And it's a relationship between history and desire, meaning that it's trying to find a relationship between what is there and what you want there to be. And it's, it's very interesting as, uh, as a thematic because I feel that in this sense, the way that you approach um, let's say, uh, abandoned buildings or broken parts of the city is extremely interesting. Instead of throwing everything away and doing a tavola rasa, you start and actually implementing. And I think this is a very good example, actually, where we're today. And I got walked around of what was the existing building and how you can implement it instead of uh, throwing it away. And I think this is something which is um, really, let's say, uh, interesting for me, maybe because of my childhood travels around the world and being in contact with various, let's say, cultures and cities, um, and obviously having studied in Venezia, the museum city, so much so that when I established with Odile Deck uh, as uh, co-founder, co-curator, uh, the Confluence Institute, and there you can see quite a the various names from the advisory board, I decided as chair of, uh, of the school to this was 2014-15, to do uh, the thematic of the year like we have right now, Healing Architecture, it was Recover, Rethink, and Reinvent. And this was something which was very important because we wanted the students to start to react to what was happening in the city, to reestablish the human milieu because it's in, it's in the city where we're living and we're interacting, and how can we work with that? And we started to have various workshops from Anupama Kondo, Luca Garofalo, Antoine Picon, Cynthia Davidson. Each one started to come in and bring their contribution. The way that the school uh, was structured was on a vertical idea, but interdisciplinary, where it was a combination of experimentation um, that you had in various workshops so that the students had their own, let's say, parkour, and they were able to break that. So we followed each student specifically on their thematic, what they wanted to do, and brought in various uh, other, uh, let's say, um, uh, contributions to start to uh, uh, nourish uh, the parkour that each one had. Because the idea was not to tell them what is right and what is wrong. It's the idea of giving you the tools so that you can have a critical eye and a critical vision and take your own uh, decisions as, as of course, as a human being. And this takes me to the last one, which is social weaving. And this is much more the idea of community building. So if the first one was environmental, the second one was architectural and infrastructure, this is about people, okay? And it's the idea, how can we start weaving back communities, especially in the reality and the polarization that we're living today, it's extremely important that we understand that rebuilding communities 
and actually, um, let's say, healing the scars that are from past both, you know, architectural, or they can be as far as populations and misunderstandings. With architecture, you're able to do that. And instead of separating, you, you need to kind of weave things together. And I think that, like I was saying, the city and the interrelationships between various humans were dealt with very well here at the Biennale, how will we live together? So it's a thematic that continuously appears, right? So you can see that the research independently, it's not been elaborated now, it's a research that is happening through time, but that is always kind of responding to what, uh, to what is happening in the world and issues that we're realizing, because of course what we see around us influences us and specifically, uh, like I was saying, in the polarized world where we are right now. So this is part of the research, and, uh, and now I would like to start with the first project. Um, the first project was a competition entry for the National Concert Hall in Vilnius. Okay, so um, for what was really interesting for us was what the ministry, uh, the culture minister said, that this needed to be a home of the nation um, and that it needed to be a link between 1918 and Lithuania today, an embodiment and evolution of continuity. And I think this was something which was um, very interesting and that we decided, okay, let's look into that and let's try to see what, how we can arrive to something that can be a link or something that can be an embodiment of an evolution. And so the program was a classic concert hall. It had a major hall and a smaller hall and a multifunctional hall and a rehearsal hall. So what we started to do is to look into the city, to understand the layers of the city. We wanted to understand what had given it its identity. And this meant that, you know, trying to see both the physical and the architectural layers uh, that were present in the city. And in that sense, we started to look at, you know, how it was oriented and how it was in line with the square and how it was specifically that that is Taurus Hill. So Taurus Hill had a strategic point, you can see it from the plan, but also from there that overlooked the entire city. And of course, on top of it <laughs> was the Trade Union Palace, uh, which was built in 1956 and it was the classic, uh, neoclassical Stalinist imperialist uh, style. Um, now, what was very particular about this was what we found in the brief. The brief said the existing building, the existing trades union palace is to be demolished. Of course, now we can start a whole kind of discussion on this uh, because specifically they had asked for a link. And I think that it's extremely important to understand that cities have a heritage, right? And it's a vital part of the built and historical identity of the city. And I think this is really important to understand because it's that that gives it authenticity and individuality, right? And one of the things that, that I want and, and relates to the things that I'm calling of adaptive reuse is that if, if preservation and innovation are not mutually exclusive. On the contrary, they should be a synergy and are necessary to provide both continuity through bibliographical history. So this is something that is very uh, important in that sense. Um, and I want to bring Libius Woods to, uh, to the table because he's talking about architecture as a social and primal constructive act, one that can heal the wounds. So what, what, what is the idea here is that we wanted to create uh, something that was able to establish this link, right? Not demolish, but actually update it and make it kind of a, a building that was able to heal this kind of scar, right? And um, to do this, we needed to change uh, the people's perception of the building. We needed to change, we needed to create a behavioral shift, right? Something that would give them a completely different view and maybe, you know, blow them away, make them dream. Just think that if anything is possible, then we can create a kind of change. And, um, and I think, yeah, I think that Libis Woods, and you will see he comes back in other times in the lecture, but is someone that has been an inspiration throughout the work because I think that the way, even if it's very theoretical, the way he approaches certain things and, and certain issues is, is very interesting. So um, 
from that point where we needed to kind of give, uh, create a, a vibrancy, create uh, you know, a, a building that was not only uh, uh, just an update of what was there, but to, to kind of transform it without taking away, of course, its uh, heritage, right? Um, so I thought, well, maybe we, we need to do something specific. And funny enough, I went to sleep because, as, as they say in Italian, la notte porta consiglio, you know, you kind of wake up, and I had a, actually a dream. And I'm, I know this is, sounds super corny, but I did have a dream about this project. Maybe it was because of the panic, and, you know, when you're working on a project, you dream the whole thing always, all the time. But I kind of woke up, and, uh, and I thought, oh, I know exactly what to do. We need to create a, a, a shift. I need to take them somewhere beautiful and then bring them back. And uh, the idea that came to mind was the famous carillon, the boîte à musique, where you kind of open and there's this beautiful ballerina that dances and you hear the music come out and you don't really know where it comes out from. And so this is the kind of concept diagram where I thought, okay, the part that is of the carillon, which is under, is going to happen under the hill. And the top part is going to be completely changed as this kind of magical space where you can have this experience of the ballerina, right? So um, as you can see in the diagram, the last one shows uh, that the two halls are under. But I want to show you um, this image, which is much more detailed, where you can see that the two uh, halls are under. We've kind of emptied the entire uh, part of the, of the building all of it so that it gives you a kind of imperial stillness that brings you back in time, right? And we've only kept certain functions from the side. And here you can actually see it more um, where you have at the top view. So there is this spiral stair. And the spiral stairs plays with this concept not only of connecting the top, connecting the halls under, but it's the movement of people. So the magic of the ballerina that is dancing is the people that are moving continuously as they go into the halls. So it's not only a connection, but it also plays with this idea of the concept. And then we had a restaurant at the top view. And as you can see in one part, a fire had burned part of the roof. So it was the idea of the phoenix coming back to life and, and opening up and dealing with certain apertures. So transforming the space. Um, and this is a little bit what you would see inside. Uh, from the side, you can see the roof. And those are the two elevations. And this is the perception from part of the building that was there uh, or from the other, from, from the side view, looking into the building. So we've kind of thought of all the spaces as a public plaza inside um, and how that would, would connect uh, downstairs. And this is... Uh, one of the key images. So when you kind of entered the space, um, the idea was that you felt like you were in another time, right? So you can kind of blow them away. And the building outside, well, it's not the same, but I mean, of course, it was, it has been uh, uh, restorated, but inside it's a completely different idea. And the cone that you see inside is kind of also like the, uh, the gramophone. So you would be in the hall, you'd enter, and you'd hear music, and you'd be surrounded by this beautiful music that you would not know where it came from, just like um, the, the Boita Musico de Carillon. Um, so this, I'm just showing you just a couple of images, because I think that what is interesting, it's the idea and the approach that is behind it. It's not actually the project and going into each specific, uh, specific part. Um, the next project that I want to um, discuss is one is the NCA Museum uh, in Moscow. Um, now the 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 site is seven kilometers away from uh, from Moscow City, and it's the Klondike Fields. And in that sense, this was an airfield um, that had uh, was used until the 90s. But the actual runway, which you see right there was used up to uh, 2000. So um, this was what was really interesting is that this is 42 hectares of land that needed to be thought. It was for a museum, but the whole site was supposed to be uh, involved. So if you look at it, there were various derelicts of airplanes for quite a long time on the site, um, which was, of course, 
for me extremely fascinating. Um, but the whole site was an immense site where you had housing all around, and it was much more of this open field, right? But at, as, as time went by, they started to develop it, and you started to have sports centers, and you started to have um, uh, performance art centers, and then at a certain point, they started to establish what you see at the back right there, the Avia Park. The Avia Park is the biggest shopping mall in Europe, um, where you can see, I mean, it's pretty huge. The numbers are kind of crazy. 5,000 spaces, uh, 390,000 square meters, right? So this is humongous, right? Um, so what they asked us to do uh, was to do the museum in this specific part, right? Um, but the whole idea was how are we going to make a museum that could be much more of, let's say, of a connective tissue from uh, the museum to the rest, right? And we were looking at the brief where it was specifically said that this was the housing, there was this park, and there, there was the museum. Um, so for me, again, thinking about the research, I'm like, okay, but there's something that we need to talk about. It's architecture, society, and nature. So there were these three elements. And I'm saying, okay, what can, what, what can we do to start connecting them? And yes, I started to think about something that could be ingrained in the memory, of course. And, and what did I think about? I thought about, of course, of planes. Um, maybe because it's my generation is uh, the Top Gun generation, even if I'm waiting for the second one, and it's been a long time that we're waiting. Uh, and Tom Cruise doesn't look like he's aged at all, so we still don't know what happened. Um, but airplanes. And so I started to look into the cockpit. And it was really interesting, because among the instrumentation, you have uh, the flight indicator or uh, the gyroscope where it tells you how you're oriented uh, based on the land, right? So the idea was that I started to look at that and started to think, okay, how can the landscape orient you towards the museum? Because I wanted to integrate the landscape and try to see how you could have, um, how you could have an interesting uh, engagement between the museum and, uh, and the landscape. And that was one of the first sketches and the kind of concept diagram became this one, where you arrived into the commercial center, and um, it was kind, of, it was a, let's say, um, a connective tissue that was made both of spaces that could be um, um, that you could have uh, recreation, but at the same time sports, at the same time part of the museum parking. So everything was structured around this. And so, of course, as any table of any architect during the night, we started um, working and, and sketching and doing study models to try and understand how we could solve, uh, you know, how we could work with the landscape and try to see um, what to do. And the, the part that you see in blue is, uh, is the museum part. Um, but looking at the program, we started to analyze the program, and we saw something which was kind of crazy. We saw that the Avia Park which had a total visitors per day, per day, per day during the weekend is 20,000 people. And they didn't want us to touch it. And I said, no, no, but this is completely crazy. So again, we decided, of course, to go against the brief because that's, that's, it's a kind of sport now, you know. If, it, as an architect, you kind of have to forge your own way. So we decided that it was extremely important that our museum not only, because initially they said that back of house of the commercial center and the back of our back of house didn't need to touch, but they needed to face each other. And I said, well, why? I mean, we have the potential of having people there. So we went back to the mechanisms of an airplane to try and kind of see how you can start to connect and how you can have um, this idea of specifically of an engine and of a connection. And going back to, again, the sketch, we started to say, okay, but we want to start perforating the actual um, building. And of course, who came to mind? <laughs> Libius Woods, right? Um, so I started to look, okay, so this is how we want to you know, crawl because initially, um, if I'm showing you this, it connected to it, right? But I thought, okay, this is not enough. We need to be, you know, more radical. Let's go radical. Let's really start to break into the building and really um, work with this idea, right? But 
as usual, I'm going to take you back in time. Um, because at this same time, we were working on something which is called a cyber prosthetic architecture. And I'm just going to, you know, follow me, please. And we're going to go back in time. The idea is a very simple one, is that if in a body, right, you, uh, there is a broken part or a broken limb, you don't throw away the body. You work with the prosthetics and you start to kind of uh, implement uh, if we think of, of, of the potential that you have with that, why can't we think the same in a building, right? Why can't we use this idea of, um, of a prosthetic? Why can't we take a building that is not deemed, let's say, uh, fit for society today or for what we request today? Why can't we give it, you know, something that is robotic or is that, that has a potential? And of course, um, starting from the human body, we went on to that. I, I wrote an article, um, a piece in Yak Bits. I'm not going to go through it. I just, if you're interested, you can kind of look this up. You can also find it on our website if it's something that you're interested. I'm not going to lecture on that part, but it's just to give you an idea where we were. We were doing this kind of research and working with, with this prosthetics. And so that's when I started to sketch, right? And I started to sketch, okay, we are going to go into the building, right? Let's start breaking into it more and more and more, right? And as you can see, we really start to perforate the building. And these are sketch perforated not only with program, but with nature, starting to take the plaza into the building itself. Um, as you can see, I'm a big fan of sketches. Um, so um, this shows you a little bit of how we were thinking of creating not only a public space, but a public space that would connect the two, right? And in section, you can see it, it was very much like, um, like a machine and airplane aesthetics where not only the building, uh, the, the museum, uh, because what you see here is both the museum and the landscape, but both start to connect, both at the top, at the roof of the actual Avia Park, and going into it and, and trying to get people so that you like um, uh, maybe the word virus is, uh, is the wrong word right now, but it's kind of, I used to use it, but maybe, maybe it's not the right one right now, but it's to contaminate the actual uh, building there and to start to lure people in because that's the idea, right? Why are we saying that the people that go in the commercial center can't have culture and be interested in the museum or in the landscape? No, that's just the contrary. You've got to, maybe the word educate is not the right one, but you've got to give them an opportunity, right, to see what, what is there. So of course, again, we started to work with um, the, the museum, which is at the top level. And here in this diagram, you can kind of see how we divided it um, between what was happening at the ground floor, which was the main foyer that connected you to the level of the plaza that bridges inside and goes into the building. And at the top, you have um, the whole idea of, um, of connecting to the roof. So the idea here is, what I discussed before, we were talking about memory, about society, the idea of connecting them, and now the idea of nature. So I wanted to start to put all of them back together, right? How can we go and really start to connect also the bottom part? So we started to look and go back to, this, to, 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 to the sketch. How can we activate all the bottom part, right? How can we activate all the landscape so that the housing would start, because otherwise you'd have the museum, the landscape, the museum, and the commercial center, but you kind of left out the housing. So the idea was, okay, let's try to set up a program that starts to dialogue with the whole housing so that the housing can become integrated in the project, so as if you're reaching out into the city, right? And of course, as we're doing these sketches, we're thinking, oh, this is amazing, yeah, okay, and then we can do this and this and that. And at a certain point, yeah, we're, we're, we're dealing right now with nature, but nature and the program, and we said, you know what? Let's just let nature take completely over. You know, why don't, what would happen if, you know, we kind of went time and, and, and you'd move completely forward? And so we started to say, okay, but what if nature started to take over the building, right? Started to kind of move into the commercial center and kind of create uh, let's say, a mountain, right? So a mountain on top of the building. Why not? Because, of course, if you start to think about it, 
right? You can start saying, okay, well, if the mountain crawls up, you can have both nature, you can have both sports because during the summer you can walk up, but during the winter you can ski down, right? So you have multiple sports that could be involved. And so we started to look also at the possibility of the biodiversity that you were creating in the forest that was one part of the project. The second part was the kind of mountain meadows and lakes because we worked, um, you didn't maybe see it here, sorry. I'm gonna go back for a second, which is something you should never do. Um, right there, you can see there, we, we worked with two lakes, uh, one, which, uh, one which is in front of the main entrance and the other one um, which is uh, close to the meadows and on top where you see all those red circles, that's a kind of forest. So it was trying to create a different, um, let's say topography, right? Um, and, um, and then after that we said, like I was saying, okay, but what happens then in the winter? Because of course in Moscow the weather is very different. So we said, oh, okay, but maybe we can start working with that, with the idea of ice skating rings, with the idea of skiing. And then of course we started to think, well, if that's the idea, how about cross country? And so we started to work with sketching on how one kilometer, four kilometers, seven kilometers, and we started to think of how we were going to do that. So that's just showing you that at each stage that we went through, we added something more that enriched, and we were trying to say, okay, how can we appeal to other people? Um, but the, the, the other layer that we decided and that we had discussed before was that of, uh, of culture. So we started to work with um, uh, the various museums that were in Moscow because we didn't want this just to be a destination or just to be something on the side. So we decided to work with that by trying to take a pavilion and placing them within the whole landscape so that not only you had a dialogue with what was happening in Moscow, but you could have small exhibitions that were happening in the space. So, I mean, um, this is what, uh, what it looked like and of course, uh, much more uh, in tune with, uh, let's say, nature and how this is the ground floor. Um, but again, I was gonna, you know, just show you the idea of how everything starts to be woven together. And of course, then the next step is to uh, start taking over on the other side, right? So as uh, as to really work and and spread into into the into the project much more as a connective tissue rather than just a project for a museum. Um, and the last project that I want to talk to you about is much more of a, uh, let's say, um, fantastical project, right? This is more, <laughs> if it wasn't fantastical enough, this is going to be really fantastical. Uh, and it's this idea that it was for, again, for a, uh, a competition that was done in Korea, in Busan. Um, and it was an old uh, bunker and from the kind of Japanese colonial era. And uh, we thought, okay, this could be really interesting to work with. And um, it had been neglected, it had been abandoned, and the competition was specifically to rethink that and the whole, uh, and the whole mountain. So what we decided to do uh, was to, um, to create a machine for change, right? So we decided, okay, we wanted to address one of the rampant issues. And of course, looking at that, we said, okay, what could be interesting to deal with here? Uh, and we started to look also at the context. And, um, and in reality, um, what we're saying is that, okay, maybe if we try to think of a, an unconventional machine, something that was unorthodox and that could challenge visitors, you know, to, to, to change, to have a behavioral shift again. Um, especially because uh, I think it's kind of important to understand that um, it's, it's much more the relationship to the, each other than, and to the environment than, uh, than other issues, right? So at that point, we started to say, okay, why, uh, why don't we deal with one of the issues which is huge at hand is right now? And it's the infodemic, right? And it's this whole idea of what's happening with information and with technology and with phones and with everything that deals with that. So I, I keep on seeing, and I think this happens also to you, uh, that you keep on seeing people even at restaurants that both of them are there with their phone 
in in Korea though it's something which is is crazy you know but I mean this right now I mean we had even the the Times cover is through said this was of course at the time when we had Donald Trump as president of the United States but <laughs> but this is misinformation has led to quite a lot of, of problematics right and uh, and this is a something that I wanted to address and I've addressed already in the past um, but why Korea is is the issue is because in 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 South Korea, it's one of the most practically um, uh, countries where there's 97 percent of the people are connected to to mobile phones, and they actually have a problem, meaning that um, a lot of the kids um, are faced with um, with not knowing the difference between a game and reality. So uh, and it's called digital dementia, and so much so that the government has started to create facilities for kids and for even older people that can try to bring them back to reality. So I thought, okay, well, this could be super interesting to work with this and try to see, okay, maybe we can work with the cyber prosthetic idea of how we can play with the, the, um, the bunker. And at the same time, how can we solve this issue that is, uh, that is rampant? And um, you just need to think that the suicide rate is extremely high, yet, um, and, and, and the population th that is declared that suffers from depression is 0 0.7, nothing, right? Because, of course, they don't want their status and people to know that they are depressed, so they're hiding this. So it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem. So what we decided to do is that we started to understand uh, the effects. So this is, the project is called Transcendence. This is a cause diagram, and we started to work on what were the causes and what was uh, what was really happening and how this was influencing the person, right? And what what uh, let's say this download and overload of information, infodemic, like I was saying, it's misinformation, it's too much information, uh, has radically changed the relationship between human beings, and it's given much more focus on oneself rather than maybe the community or civility or 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 each other, right? So we started to work. On this, this diagram is very legible, but it's a huge diagram. And then this was instead the actual uh, effects of it. Uh, so we wanted to study specifically the effects because there starts to be certain effects that nobody knows what they are because they are unprecedented, they are uncharted. So a lot of people don't know uh, what is happening. And so this was something which was very interesting on, on seeing how uh, specifically, uh, this whole, whole uh, kind of self-centered idea is something that, uh, that is, is, is pushing very much uh, people to, uh, to nervous breakdowns, uh, to burnouts, to quite a lot of issues. Um, and in this case, I wanted to, um, to, to go back uh, with something. Wait a second, because it doesn't... Okay. Um, I wanted to go back to something which is... Uh, which I dealt with much earlier, which is architectural whispers. And this was, I wanted to talk about this because this again dealt with this idea that face-to-face -face conversations are more important, right? Because instead of, this was established in Paris at the Club Silencio by David Lynch, and it was conversations between various architects that I would sit down in a room, we'd all have this face-to-face -face conversation with everybody that could integrate. It was not on a stage, it was in the middle of people, because I thought we needed to go back to that. Instead of these images, instead of these screens, let's talk face-to-face -face and really try to understand. Um, and this went on for quite some time. We had various events with various, uh, with various titles, um, and it was a very interesting time, and um, and what was really important is that I wanted to take away the ego out of the equation, meaning that there was no images at all. It was just talking. So if someone had doesn't have any ideas or the ideas that they had were not strong enough to be supported just by images, it would be a different story, right? You would discuss, you would really see, and so it was uh, much more about the personal, uh, the personal interaction. Um, and then this, of course, um, was very successful. This happened quite some time ago, and a lot of other people started to take it up, and it, in other platforms, they started to have face-to-face -face discussions. Uh, zooming forward to practically the Dark Side Club, um, which is 
Again, this idea of digital submission or architectural domination. Again, this thing that, that leads back to the first kind of um, exhibition that I'd done where I was talking about sketching the world in one city. But again, how does the digital take over, right? And the discussion was, Really, uh, have we delegated power to technological systems to the extent that we are now in an age of submission? So who is the master, who is the slave? This was quite an interesting conversation. And as you can see, Sile is up there. That's how I met Sile the first time. Um, so, in, and it started out as a dinner, and then it went into a, a conversation where there was various architects um, uh, discussing. Uh, and But this was something that I just wanted to show you because it's showing you how at the same time that certain work is happening, and curatorial work is happening. Everything is happening at the same time because it's the interest. And so, going back to the project, we decided to, to, to work with Dante. So I decided that I was going to go, again, triptych, right? Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. And we decided that we wanted to, to create the, the, a place where visitors would undergo a form of cleansing, right? A, a transcendence, one that is therapeutic introspection, right? Fostering renewed appreciation of one's social, um, uh, let's say, human existence and in relation to each other. So um, we divided it specifically into the bunker, which was the game Inferno, the void purgatory, and the light is the paradiso. And so this is how we started to play with each one of these. Um, and you can see again here uh, a three-dimensional uh, representation of it and how we started to think exactly um, how we would be able to deal not only in line with, of course, the Dante's um, uh, Inferno, Paradiso, Purgatorio, but also how we could relate it to nature. And the first one uh, was, uh, was specifically the game, right? The game which was the inferno, right? And how we, this could become um, uh, let's kind, uh, a kind of labyrinth because the idea that you can get lost and found is, is something that creates an strong emotional changes and the fear of maybe even dying inside will create uh, a, a kind of shocking mo movement in yourself and you'll be able to have this kind of cathartic moment. And so we started to look at each of these and um, the, the one of the initial parts is that this was the rotation mechanism. So we started to say, okay, what if we can rotate it? Um, uh, and it, it's kind of the possibility of rotating, of being able to create this, will be an immersive experience, right? You're inside and you don't know what's going to happen. So this has multiple possibilities. The, the idea of this, that it an extension and closing mechanism. What if the tunnel started to uh, get larger? What if it started to compress, right? So there were various parts that we started to look into it and see how this could change. And this is one of the examples of, let's say, we, we, we started to think, okay, how can the person go from place A to B, and what would he go through in this idea? Because we wanted to create a tension wave that would range, you know, uh, of experiences from low, high, happy, sad, so that we could create a whole kind of variation in different contexts. Um, so this was one, um, and this was, for example, another one. And I'm going to show you, in, to, in the next one, a small video of, of, of what the idea was. So this was a, a video that we produced um, for, for the competition where you would enter, and it would be, <laughs> it sounds a little bit like a nightmare, right? And, and as you move through the space, different things change. Um, and the other part, which is extremely interesting, is that you would have a, a haptic bracelet, right? That would be next to your skin, and in that sense, it would transfer the data of your temperature, of your heartbeat, right? And that was playing with the idea of Virgilio, right? So how Virgilio was going to be your guide, this was going to be your guide, without you knowing. You'd be led into each of these spaces, right? Um, and then into the main computer, which kind of figured out everything, and the main computer is Minosse. So it was playing with, that's why I say it's a kind of fantastical, uh, fantastical experience where, where each person led a different one because they're, 
depending on, on where you entered, you might have to deal with certain people. You might have to, that if you don't deal with them, you're going to die. So it was all this kind of wild uh, experience. And from this kind of um, crazy moment, you'd walk into purgatory, right? And purgatory was this kind of stillness that you had, and it was this void, it was this emptiness that you would enter, and the feeling that you would have is uh, like this, maybe with the lights it's not very clear, but you had all the steps that would go up, and you'd have the seven uh, what the mountain of purgatory is divided by seven, and so you'd have that and walk into then, um, um, let's say, into paradise, right? So the access to paradise happens through a kind of elevated space, but the whole idea was that it was rearranged and it was thought in uh, based on, on all the... Um, and the circles of paradise. And, and the idea here was that you would, from the moment that you kind of got completely changed, no phones, no nothing, and you kind of went, went through this kind of transcending experience, you would then enter the purgatory where you would kind of breathe and kind of understand, uh, and there would be a kind of you know, social and educational evolution, and then you'd get back to paradise where there would be potentially this shift, right, to reshaping your identity and the relationship between others. So it was very much about this kind of fantastical project where you, you would be able, a machine for social change, so that you could be much more empathetic and, uh, and aware uh, both of the people and your uh, surrounding. Because of course in paradise you arrive to the so-called at the end, the imperium, where you're in the middle of nature and this, this place was absolutely beautiful. So it's a parkour from there which comes from the history. So you're going through this place and kind of giving it a, a, a different kind of meaning. So um, that, I mean, it was, it, it's, it's very strange because when I, when I looked at it, um, I, I thought, wow, these days when I was preparing the lecture, I'm like, this looks like Squid Games. It looks like everybody's gonna get shot here, but it's just the opposite, guys. So when I was doing it, I'm like, and, and everybody's talking about Squid Game. I'm like, no, 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 this is not about killing. This is about healing because when everybody, you know, we were talking about, of course, the first one, Inferno, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, you're, it's exactly this, no. But the object is, of course, is the restoring the natural awareness. It's fighting digital dementia. It's uh, interior fulfillment. So it's something that you're kind of detracting certain things then to refill it with something um, which is more uh, positive. So in general, I think that um, the idea is, is that it needs to be a call to action. Uh, and I, I wrote this down because I think that it's import, important to, to understand that for what is happening in the world right now, we need to be agents of change and, 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 and much more questioning what instead of what people want, but it's what people need, right? So it's not about, oh, I want this, I want that. And no, you, like you've seen, I've, maybe this is something that I've learned for Peter Eisenman, um, going against the grain and actually forging your own way. But you need to, you need to forge the way, you need to really understand and sometimes question certain briefs that are happening. And like I said, um, uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. And I was saying it also today, you know, to experiment. I mean, just think that, you know, um, in, in, in past times, not mine, but the generation before, uh, <laughs> you know, architects were considered to be more interesting and more to uh, on the frontier if they lost the competition because it meant that their ideas were bolder, right? So, you know, failing is, is, is perfectly fine. It's only by failing and experimenting, you know, I mean, just think of the people who are doing research. How many times do they fail before they find, let's say, a vaccine, you know? It's something which is very important. Um, but I would like to close with something which is a little bit more provocatory um, because it's very dear to me. Um, and it's because I came here with my students, right? And it was something that has fostered quite a lot of discussions and quite a lot of things from, uh, from the practice because it was very long time ago, it was 2011. And it's, of course, it's the Lina Hall. Um, and with that, I want to close the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mark. You're welcome. Uh, it's time for questions or um, discussion. Okay.
Hello, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. I thought that it's very, it was very interesting on the conceptual level in general, and I really loved your expressiveness of your ideas. But in the past weeks or months, I was thinking about the connection of the ideas, of the conceptuality, and the real implementation. Uh, because in the closing s uh, slides, you wrote uh, a call to action, right? right. So uh, I'm really interested in your opinion. How do such an conceptual ideas uh, can be in a way implemented into the reality or to whom they are relative to? Okay. Okay, so that would be my question. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that, of course, if, uh, if one starts to think of how these can be implemented, you'd say, of course, we did the competition. We didn't win any of the, any of the three competitions because we went completely against the grain. That's why it's, uh, it's more theoretical. But I mean, just think of, uh, for example, if, if I tell you, uh, Libius Woods, how that has influenced the world of architecture, or, or even Peter Eisenman with certain ideas that become experimental, and then people take them up and change them. And maybe instead of doing, they just do the first piece. Mm -hmm. It's already something. But someone has got to you know, go on the moon, right? And someone needs to think about it. Were the people, the first people on the moon, the ones that actually sketched and drew uh, you know, the comic books that were saying that was on the moon? It's trying to make an idea become real. So I think it's, yes, of course. At a certain point, there is going to be those who are going to have ideas and are going to be trailblazers, and those are which actually are going to be able to implement those ideas. And um, in a certain sense, yes, I couldn't. If if you think about it, I mean, I've had the practice now for ten years, and I won't tell you how many competitions. Otherwise, you'd probably stop doing architecture. But I've done a lot of competitions, and I do not give up because the one that you saw in uh, in Vilnius was 2019. So I just don't give up. You just can't give up and, 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 you know, and try to push the thing, your beliefs. It's, I mean, I don't know if, uh, I hope some of you have read The Fountainhead that a lot of us always talk about, Howard Droke. Uh, has, have, have any of you read it? No, oh my God, none of you have read it. So it's a book that, that of course, is by Anne Rand where it talks about the, the pursuit of certain ideas and the ethics of not bending to certain ideas. So sometimes, yeah, you've got to push, push, push. I mean, if you think also about specifically, for example, Peter Eisenman, you know, his idea have been revolutionary. How many projects has he really built? Not that many. But is he considered, for many, the father of deconstructive architecture? It, yes. Is he my mentor? Yes. I mean, a lot of the things come from him and that have developed. And a lot of people still consider that, you know, what he's done has been seminal for so many things, but they haven't been built. But, you know, I mean, for certain cases, I always uh, think that there is a hope in that. And the more you're, you know, try to, uh, to, to put it out there, the more there is possibility. I mean, just think of Greta. I mean, she started and it's more and more and now at the COP and, you know, things need to be, it's not because you don't have an audience sometimes that you renounce to it. Because this is maybe one of the problems that is, uh, that is happening right now, is that you're always waiting for an audience. You're always waiting for likes. You're always waiting. No, that's not what you're doing it for. You're doing it because as a human being, you want to bring about change. You want to really make a difference. And sometimes you might do an entire life doing that. Or sometimes you might be lucky and someone does see you and someone does put a light on you and does realize that that's the potential. Um, I don't know if that answers a little bit the question. It's a little bit dreamy, as usual. Yeah, uh, it is a little bit dreamy, but I like it that you say it that way. And uh, so, in a way, your whole purpose is about the message, right? To educating and... Well, no, I mean, I'd, I'd love to build one of these things, <laughs> right? It's not, uh, of course, I'd love to. That's why, by the way, the image that is there is, is a built one, but it's a long time ago. It was a collaboration with Peter Eisenman. So uh, in, in that sense, that's why that one is there, because I asked, silly, but why'd you put this one? Because it's built, you know? And I'm like, yeah, well, yes, you're right, you know? So there's no hiding uh, from that, that you're, you know, we are building other things, but obviously trying to push the message and push the, you, 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 
you have to have like a, a manifesto, right? So exactly. this is the manifesto, right? You have your manifesto, where you're going with your ethic and where, where do you think you want to go? And in some projects you push it more, in some projects you push it less, but you, it needs to be there so that if anybody starts to, uh, for example, we, we're working on a project in South Nigeria right now that they just asked to work on a project. And I said, you know, why are you coming to us? What is in, you know, and, and the first, uh, ah, yeah, because I was looking at your research, I really think it's in, oh, okay, good. Because you need to understand that that's, you know, that's the core of what it is. Because otherwise, you're just doing anything, and, and, and that, for me, is a problem. Thank you. Yeah. Could you please stand up? Hi. <clears throat> mm, so, you emphasized the importance of sketching, right? Yes. So I'm wondering uh, what is exactly a sketch for you? What is, what is a sketch and what is not in the sense that uh, nowadays uh, it is more and more in kind of, um, I mean, the computer generated designs are getting better and better. Yes. Which means that eventually it will become the, obsolete. Is that the, what you're the saying? The creativity of the computer kind of augments the human a lot. So I'm wondering, is the computer-generated stuff included in sketching? So, or? so that's actually a very good question because uh, thank you for pointing that out. Because in the in the exhibition, a world in one city, a sketch for London, we had digital sketches. There were digital sketches there, and it was you know certain people have this ability to use the computer as a way to sketch. And I don't mean just a digital pen on a, on a sketch, but actually to sketch ideas and really manipulate. I guess my generation, I started uh, quite late. So I actually started with Rhino 1.0. So, so <laughs> you guys don't even know what Rhino 1.0 is. I even have a t-shirt with the Rhino logo. So it's like <laughs> olden times. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like, it's a reliquia. Yeah, so it's something that in that sense, uh, we, I welcome those sketches, but it's a question of really seeing that the sketch is not, is, is, mm, is able to illustrate an idea and a concept. So for me, a sketch is not the sketch. It's actually, can your sketch transmit your idea or your concept very simply that you're doing something that, that, that the minute it comes out, you're like, oh yes, I get it, that's what it is. And then you can enrich it, right? So that's what I consider a sketch. I am used to that because I also paint, I do sculpture, so I'm very active in multiple fields. So the, the, the actual, the use of the hand just comes easier, right? So for me, it is the hands, the coloring, the, the, and what you saw there in reality is one single sketch that is this high because it's one on top of the other. So I, I pull up and down, and it's not even floors. It's actually trying to see the changes, and sometimes I have to number them, and sometimes I put one in front of the other, and I say, ah, okay, well, maybe this option was better. And it makes me think much faster than a screen, because the problem with a screen, it's one screen. And then you need to take away this image. This image is not there anymore, and it's this one. On the sketch, you have it right next to you, right? So you're able to, you know, in a certain sense, pan out and go, okay, yeah, this is like that, this is like that, okay, and then you can work on it and rip a part of one, yes, of course, you can rip it, take part of the sketch and move it on the other side. But the idea that you're in contact with, the, with, with them at multiple times, yes, you could put them, okay, on the sketch, but it's just not the same thing because you wanna zoom in and you wanna look and you wanna sketch and then you pull it out. You have a certain ability, unless our, the computer is not there, but it's here, then it seems a little, at least for me, it seems a little bit difficult. But to, to, to zoom, zoom out of the question, I think it's the, quest, is the, is the fact of being able to portray an idea and a concept in a very simple way. Being computer sketched or whatever, I'm fine with it. Uh, some people, even some of my students, would present it through music. And they say, I wanted to, you to hear this piece of music because I think that this conveys this and this. And they would say, and I'd say, ah, oh, yeah, fantastic, I get it. You know, that's what a sketch is. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I'm like, I got it now. <laughs> Thank you, Matteo. You're welcome. Fascinating lecture. Um, just a few comments on the, on the previous ones. Why 
in terms of the Ayn Rand Fountainhead, um, in SciArc it was prohibited literature. Uh, so it might be that um, I haven't uh, haven't really pushed any of my students to, uh, into reading. This Have item. you read it? Yeah. yeah. And what do you think? Uh -uh. Why not? <laughs> Let's discuss that over okay, dinner. Okay. Um, I have a question <laughs> regarding the uh, the physical and um, and drawn space, or let's say curated thoughts uh, and crystallized into um, uh, some kind of matter. Okay. And I'm I'm wondering if um, that is true that you showed us uh, projects that have not yet been crystallized uh, and and really. Uh, push through into the level of, of, of detail, but you have uh, constructed installations or demonstrators mm -hmm. of certain ideas. And I, I wonder if, if, you have, um, uh, if you have experienced a difference between the, the written text or uh, um, let's say you call it a manifesto and then the physical manifest of it. And what kind of uh, different ideas you can convey and is there do you feel a d difference in uh, what uh, the space can tell to its uh, users or visitors or and what uh, what the written text can do oh yeah because because no. that's i think it's really important because you have curated also a lot of talks right and, right. and i think those discussions are super essential but then Sometimes a building can say, or an installation, or a demonstrator can say more than a thousand words. So I'm wondering if if architecture and the, uh, can and the image of uh, a physical building can do more than uh, oh yes, than a discussion. And what are, what are those differences? Well, yeah, I think that that's a, a great question, and I wouldn't expect anything less. Um, um, I think it's there is a huge difference. Right between what uh, the kind of discussions, and that's also when we had the discussions of architectural whispers. That's why uh, the whole idea was not to have images, right? Because I really wanted to understand what the ideas were and try to have a discussion. Um, but there is, um, in a certain sense, there is a splitting of what is happening in a discussion, because that, that, that was one of the issues why I also started Architectural Whispers, because I was hearing, um, let's say, uh, post-rationalized, I was reading post-rationalized text on projects that had nothing to do with it. And I was like, wait a second, this is completely post-rationalization. It's not really what they're thinking, because I, I know I've talked to them about it and in the past. and. And so you, or, or, or you can just to give it a layer, right? To say, okay, no, this, that, to make yourself beautiful with a, with a text. And I think that this is, well, this depends really on the approach. And I think it's, where do you start from? Do you start from, let's say, a research? And do you start from, you know, for example, when I work on projects, the text is not written towards the end. The text is written as a manifesto before. I kind of work, while I'm working with the research, I'm writing down, I'm working on it, and I'm trying, it helps me elaborate the ideas. So it's used as a tool, not as a tool of representation and communication. It's used as a tool of design. So we're working on a model, we're working on the sketches, and we're working on the text. Because I think that each one, when I'm putting, it's very hard to put down certain ideas. Yes, and you do them with the models or you do them with the sketch. But actually writing them down is something that I've always told my students, don't do the text before. I, I would collect text on project much earlier because I, what is your intention, right? So in a certain sense, in, in the approach in the office and what I've, I've, what I've tried to teach, it is very much integrated, so it's not it's not post. A lot of times, I actually write it down and think, okay, what, what could this be? And you go back to it. But be between the actual manifesto and the actual working on it, yes, you try to apply it. For example, the projects that that we're now working in Nigeria or the one in Tuscany that we're working, I I continuously have discussions with the client because I'm saying, okay, but. You know, we need to understand, because of course it's, a, it's an existing building in Tuscany, and so we're trying to understand what are the possibilities and how we can transform it and update it and do something that deals with nature. And at the same time, we would like to work with certain prosthetic parts, but of course then uh, the, the problem is how much money do you have to do that with a certain client? And 
it is it is an issue for certain times, right? That, that that you kind of have this discussion and you have to to take a decision. But in general, maybe that's also the reason why there's not that much built stuff. There's nothing practically, you know, except installations that have happened. And those have an advantage, of course, because when you're building an installation, there is a possibility that you can really experiment. And maybe the public, the way they look at, at, at an installation is it's an experimentation, it's a work of art. So they don't give you the same rules that they give you for a building. So uh, there is that, but I mean, I, if, if I really see the difference, yes, I do, but I try to, 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 to go back to it a lot of the time. And, and maybe if I can go back to what I was telling um, the question before is that I try to, um, let's say at least with the clients, tell them why you're coming to us, that even before we get a commission, we have a discussion. So it's not what do you want, it's like what do you really need, right? You know, the, 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 the phrase that I was saying is, okay, I would like to have this, okay, but I, okay, now I think that you should have it, of course, as, as an architect, you're trying to interpret, but you're trying to also at the same time help them understand, and if you have an agenda, and in, in a certain sense, if you have a manifesto, that you're trying to push certain things which are both environmental, which are both infrastructure, let's say, with the reuse, and both social, because if you're doing something which is public, it's, it's also about the social interaction, I tried to ten put that instantly forward. Has it worked for me? Mm, well, from what you can see, it hasn't worked so far uh, that well. But uh, again, th this, the same thing is I'm saying, yeah, I hope it does. In installation, it has, because of course they love it. They're like, oh yes, because it's more conceptual and it's more justified. But in architecture, yes, we are building and we're trying to play with that. We have now a new client in South Nigeria which seems to be super enthusiastic about it and really trying to push the, the boundaries. Let's see if it goes all the way to the end. Right? So yeah, I always, I always try to do that. I mean, but um, yeah, haven't succeeded so far. But then again, you know, we're here until we're 90, so it doesn't make any difference. We're definitely not going in pension. I don't think I am, at least. It's not a profession we can see from our you know, uh, other architects that are out there right now, that 89, 90, you're still out there. So, um, yeah, I'm not scared of that. I'm ready. I'm ready. Here I come. I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. I would like some questions from the students. More, more. Come on, come on. It doesn't happen that often that you get a person here, and I don't get that often uh, to be in front of students. Let's take this opportunity. Ah, let's take this opportunity to leave. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm, I'm not a st student anymore, but okay, that's it, okay. That's okay. But it's 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 quite close. Uh, I thank you very much for the presentation. I think that it's very fresh. Like it almost feels like you don't critique yourself in your work. It's just it's just to you let yourself go. Um, and this is very nice to see. I, I, I think it's actually quite fascinating. But um, my there's my always a but. There comes the no, but. You it's, go. It's, no, it's it's not actually. It, it, but in the same time, like it, the creation process also seems a bit uh, lonely, or it. I can't really imagine myself working with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is bad. Uh, that is bad. Cut the camera. Cut the camera. We don't no, want this to go uh, no. out. Tell, no. Tell me why. Uh, no. Because the people I, love working with me. I, I, I actually maintain people which have been uh, colleagues in the office. I, they're, they're always coming back. So I'm really curious what, is it the energy? What, what is it? What is it? Tell me. No, I, I mean, I just, I don't think I can see what you see, if you understand what I mean. Or yeah. like if you, if you, for example, the Moscow project. Yeah. And uh, just to put myself in that position uh, or position where... I would be able to give some feedback or some kind of uh, additional layer to your thought process or your Oh, process. no, no, you wouldn't believe the, the amount of process. I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of possibilities that people have in the office because any idea can come from anybody. Because the minute that you are in a very fertile environment where anything goes and everybody's idea is there, you will have certain ideas. I guarantee it's not, it's, I mean, 
I understand what you're saying. You think it's kind of daunting because or here he comes and he's doing, oh, yeah, this, do this, and I go, uh, uh, like that. No, it's actually the opposite because in the office, it's very much that someone is working on the model, someone is working on this, someone sketches. It's very much about a collaborative uh, thing that it, it doesn't really... It doesn't really, inf or at least this is what they tell me, but I'm just saying that in a certain sense, that's what I did. When I went to work for Peter Eisenman, don't think it was easy. I mean, uh, you know, it's Peter Eisenman, and I worked for him for five years. But, and at the beginning, I remember, you know, he used to give us lectures also during lunchtime, so no lunch break. <laughs> from, I'm not going to tell you the hours, but they were tough. Um, but I loved them. I loved every minute of them. And at lunchtime, he would give us lectures. And all I did was take notes, because I had no idea what, you know, so many references and so many things. By the end, after I stayed five years, I was like, yeah, so, yeah, 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 but this and that. So you learn, right? So it doesn't mean that if something is bigger than you, uh, you can't achieve it. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting myself, bear in mind, I'm not putting myself up and telling, oh, if you come in, it's a different, I'm just saying that in general, um, it's this fear that I was talking about before of maybe, oh, maybe I can't contribute. Maybe No, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You, and if you contribute in a way that maybe is not right, I'll teach you the way that is right. You know, it's, and is there right? Is there wrong? It's not. It's giving you the tools to have this critical thinking. And I think that, yes, you're saying that maybe I'm not criticizing myself, um, but there is a lot of critique that, that happens in dialogue also in the office, of course. So the minute that we sit around the table when we're doing like a competition, we're saying, okay, what do you think? Oh, this is great. Oh, but how about if we do that? Ah, okay, maybe this. So there is being open, but there is, um, there, of course, my office is not an easy office. I'm not going to say it's like a walk in the park because uh, because it's not, uh, because we work crazy hours, but it's because whatever comes out, I always want to change. Uh, uh, uh. It's even the lecture, the last minute, I was like, okay, let me change one more thing. You're always trying to make it better. And I mean, this is when you're doing design and when you're trying to do something that you're always trying to ameliorate yourself. So um, it doesn't, it, I really, I wouldn't think, nobody in that sense has told me about the office that that it's daunting. Um, I have to be, uh, no, I'm, 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 but I, I, I welcome the, the, the critique, but I'm just saying that maybe, <laughs> and that shows you how much I accept critique, no, uh, but uh, in that certain sense, that the fact that you need to have the strength to, to do it anyway, you do it, and then if it, if, if it is a toxic environment, no, but it's not a toxic environment, but if it challenges you, to do more and you're saying, maybe I wouldn't be able to have ideas. Yeah, because what you're seeing, I'm illustrating them, but this is teamwork. It's always been teamwork because everybody's there and when you're drawing them and when you're starting to put them together, you kind of realize certain things and you're like, ah, okay, maybe this should change. Maybe this could have something different. So it doesn't necessarily um, mean that there is no space. On the contrary, there's quite a lot of space, much more than, than at least I let tr transpire from, from what I was saying. there, uh, how long uh, do you work on, on such a Okay, so content? for ex well, for example, the one in Russia, uh, in Moscow, uh, it's a long time because that project started many years ago. And as we started to implement the project and test new ideas, I'm like, oh no, but let's change this one. Let's say, so we did the competition. The competition is a month, right? It's a month and a half, close to two. And then but the project continues. If I find that there is something interesting in the project, I don't stop it because it's part of the research. It's part of the interest that you're doing in, in, in your practice. So yes, for example, the one in, uh, in, in Vilnius, you wouldn't believe it, but it was done in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in 10 days. So, that, so I can just imagine the nightmare in the office. But uh, it was done in 10 days because Initially, we weren't going to do it, and then I had my dream, and I said, we got to do it, guys. They're like, no, and, and so we did it, but it's something that has developed, and we are developing it, and we're continuing. You haven't seen, and, uh, none of these three projects have been, uh, no, one, the, the bunker was published, 
but the other ones haven't been published because it's it's part of the work that is coming out and it's not really an interesting oh i need to put the image out there and it's a it's part of the research that we're going so when i'm uh, presenting projects or when i'm talking to i will bring this to the table to show them and when i feel that it's arrived to a certain point i will publish it but it's because it's not oh i, I can't touch it no you it's it's part of a process so in this sense um, for example, the Russia one was, uh, the Moscow one was, the competition was 2014. And right now, we submitted it in 2021 for the Seoul Biennale. So it's still through time because it has evolved, it has changed through cyber prosthetic architecture, through the weaving, through the, you know, it has evolved as a project. So a lot of the projects that you see uh, were uh, th the one of the Vilnius was what was produced for the competition, which was produced in you know ten days, two weeks time. But the other ones are projects that have evolved through time, and and for example, the one of the of the bunker, we did propose this whole idea, but of course the images and all that that is now worked much more as it was worked afterwards. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it really depends. What do you mean, how many people? Uh, how many people in the office work on one project? Oh, the whole office works on it. Uh, yes, ah, OK, so you're asking how many. <laughs> sorry. I'm like, so depending, for example, on the competition that we did for the Vilnius, it was uh, four of us. The competition that we worked on uh, on the Moscow one was six of us. Uh, so the, it, it also, it all depends on who is there in the office at that moment. And I sit down and say, okay, do you think we can do it based on other projects that we're doing? Is this something that we're going to cope? And since it's a euphoric kind of situation, yeah, let's do it. And then you're like, no, why did we say this? You know, but uh, yeah, it, 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 I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of a, of a competition maniac, meaning that it give, it's like I'm a little bit addicted to it right now. Uh, because it just gives me the adrenaline rush, right? And and I have friends which are architects, because I mean, I've I've been in the profession now for some time. Besides my practice that was established in 2010, but competitions with Peter, with Kupimebla, and with Isozak, I can the amount of competitions. I, but it's just amazing because you churn out new ideas. You are able to test things. So, I find them fantastic. But not a lot of the people that I've gone, some people in the office have come specifically because we do international competition and they want to feel, you know, what it means, what it means to have a concept and idea. Nah? But some other ones are like, no, no, I don't do international, I don't do competitions anymore. That's it, bust. I've given my blood. And, uh, but this is even friends that tell me, you're still doing competitions? And I'm like, yes, I am. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm a super how, how romantic. How is that anyhow feasible? Or how can you afford this kind of system? Or how, how is it running, the office? What do you mean? How's on, it on what field? <laughs> <laughs> on, on certain projects that are there. Of course, there are certain projects that are, for example, the one in Tuscany, the one in, uh, in uh, South Nigeria, the one in Colorado. There are projects which I haven't illustrated that are actually running and that we're pushing, but we're not as pushing as much as one pushes in the competition. But this is in every office. I mean, maybe it's in the ones that I uh, was in contact with, but for example, at Zaha or even at... Eisenmanns or at Kupimabla, there was always, or even Remkulas, there are parts which are the built projects that kind of nourish certain parts. And then there is the part which works on competition to get new projects and to push new things. So, um, so it's the same, but the projects that are real, for example, one which was very big at the time was one that I had in Paris, which was um, uh, La Forêt Urbaine, which was 1,400 square meters of a penthouse that was really pushing, you know, working with ecology and really bringing nature inside the building and really working with that. And, you know, it was on construction site for two years and a half. So, and that brought quite a lot of money. And we did various competitions at the time. For example, the one in Russia was done uh, specifically under that. So the team was a team of 10 in the office. And so, okay, can we do this competition? Yeah, let's do it. So it's very much a dialogue. So yeah, there's certain times where the office has been and yeah, I still do the competition and maybe it's just myself uh, not sleeping and working around the clock, but that's, that's the passion, right? It's an interesting lecture when you, you balance it out, you show what work you had to do in order to do this competition. Oh, you, you don't want to know. Oh, well, that's <laughs> no, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Boring for some people. 
No, 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 it was actually... No, no, yeah, but no, but uh, competitions, I mean, I learned this from, from the places that I work. More than a month and a half, then it does, you lose money. You, you, then, then it doesn't work. So, but which means a month, a month and a half, which means you're churning time like there's no tomorrow. You know, it's like uh, you're really working. But I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's like I'm an eternal optimist and, and everybody's like, what, how do you still have this energy? I just do, I don't know. Because it's something that I really love. And so when people are like, how can you do 72 hours without sleeping to hand in a competition? I, I just do. I don't drink coffee, I don't drink alcohol, I don't do drugs, but that's just the way it is. I mean, it's, it's also a question of training. Some, some people, you know, some people say, oh, no, I, I, I can't do this anymore. Well, 72 now is a little bit harder, but up to two years ago, it was, uh, it was still very feasible. But it's just something that it's just driving you because you want to get there. And it's not because why do you have this myth that you have to work crazy hours? It's not because it's crazy hours. It's because you want to deliver something, and un until you have the last moment, like you can in the, in the okay, <laughs> because you can't. I mean, I think it's a question that you can't be satisfied. At least I'm not satisfied. There's always something better that you can do. There's always something that you can learn while you're doing it. So I'm never going to stop until until you've got a hand in, until there's the deadline, and and they take it away. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, I'm done. We can go have a coffee. Let's go have dinner, and we hand in tomorrow. Are you joking? No, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's kind of, it's kind of weird, but it's it's. Uh, I guess it's a, uh, it's a philosophy. It's a way of life. I don't know. I mean, it's a, uh, it's strange, but uh, that's the way it is. And it should, and, and ideally, it should be contagious. You know, that's. The <laughs> but you yeah, exactly. <laughs> Continued with the romantics and the word competition, a pragmatic question. How do you choose the competition? How do I choose the competition? Well, I choose. Because the place were being used, Moscow. Oh, well, these were competitions where I actually thought the brief was really interesting. Okay. And the other th that it's not only the brief. Funny enough, I actually look at the jury. I look at the jury because that will tell me that if I do, if I can experiment, is the jury a jury that is going to welcome experimentation and they are willing to see what is design architecture or what is, is it something like that? Or is it a jury where I actually go through each jury member, look at what they've done, da, 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 and see if it's something that they are welcoming towards you know, being doing something different or doing, and anyway, we have also, let's say, these part of the research that we're working on. So I'm first I'm saying, okay, is it in line? Oh, this could be really interesting to experiment this. Okay, let's see who the jury is. The jury is, oh no, they, 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 they've only done boxes and they want this and this and that. Okay, maybe this is not really going to work, you know. And then you exchange, you exchange with your colleagues. Are you doing this one? Yeah, what do you think? Oh, maybe we can, you know, having traveled the world and worked in big, uh, in big firms, I have friends in each of them, so a lot of times we're doing the Vilnius one. I had three friends that were doing competitions at the same time, and we're like, I, I don't know, I have, what did you, did you see this? Oh yeah, I saw that, oh, okay, good. So sometimes we even help each other, right? Um, telling you certain things, did you notice this in the brief, did, it, did you understand this? So it's also an exchange, so, and of course, the minute that you know that the big offices in certain sense are doing them, it means that they had evaluated certain criteria, right? So it's a, it's a game between all of these things that it's, it's a balance. And obviously being a megalomaniac, if Zaha does it, of course I'm gonna do it, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, of course, so it's. Uh, <coughs> um, I noticed a little bit of a small problem in my opinion here in the sense that you uh, <laughs> you emphasize the uh, architect coming in and helping to transform the traumatic past experiences of the people right yeah but at the same time you are coming in in 10 days doing the Vilnius project and you are not the local architect so this means that you have no time to understand or, or get to know all the 
traumatic triggers of the local people. No, no, but so bear in mind, sorry, yeah. when I say 10 days, it's 10 days of production. Eh? It's not mm -hmm. the 10 days that you start doing the competition. I said that at a certain point, there was a whole mm -hmm. research, there was mm -hmm. a, everything of understanding, and then I hadn't found a solution. So usually the first part of research is quite big, right? So, and then at a certain point, based on all that I'd read, based on the brief, based on the model, based on the things we said, okay, let's do it. Because a competition, when you do it, then you have to deliver mm -hmm. on a date. And I have to be honest, it took quite some time before deciding whether to do it or not. You always give yourself a month and a half. But so the research took so much time and I didn't have an idea and I didn't know how to solve this idea of the link of this continuity mm -hmm. and it didn't come to me. So we were probably not going to do it and then, I know it's funny to say, and then I kind of had this vision in this dream and I said, I think I know how we do it. I sat down with the team, I explained the idea, and he said, shall we do it or not? And they said, okay, let's do it. And for 10 days, we just produced and tried to get as much as, and of course, 10 days is 20 days, bear in mind, depending on the hours you work. So, uh, so 10 days on a normal firm is, is you know, in our, in our time is a little bit longer. But I did sit down with them and say, okay, do we want to do it after all this research? Because I've been also in offices where at a certain point you're halfway through and you're like, yeah, we're not going to do this, okay. and you stop. Yeah, but in this case, uh, in this research part, uh, how exactly or how much effort do you put into understanding the, uh, the psychology of the local people? So, because so actually, in, in, um, yeah. so we had... One of the students, because I did, I was, I was telling um, someone today that I was walking around. That was the, um, the year when I came to Tallinn. I, I did, uh, the studio was Vilnius, Tallinn, and Riga. So I had been uh, to Vilnius. I had seen, I had, we had done actually projects in the city. It was a studio that lasted four months. We came to visit. Uh, we stayed a certain amount of time. There was a huge amount of research that was done. So it... So in reality, we had worked in Vilnius with students. So this, the class was composed of 30 students, and each one had decided a city. Here it was the, the Lina Hall that they had decided, and they were working with this idea. And at the time, we had worked with Vilnius. So I had understood, and we had done presentations. So it had been, been four or five months of research, not just of myself, of my entire class. Only one part, one third, because one, most of them picked uh, in, in reality, Riga, and some picked uh, Tallinn, and some picked Vilnius. So that was part of the research. And we had uh, someone in the office that was uh, specifically from Vilnius, meaning that it was, it was a student that decided to help us. She was not part of the team, but she came in because she was friends of friends uh, of, of one of the interns that was there. And they said, oh, you know, uh, Erika is, is, is for, ah, okay, wait, why don't you let her in, and we'll, we'll talk to her. So in reality, it's, uh, yeah, the fact, I was very fortunate. And while you were telling me, I'm like, yeah, but yeah, that's true. How did, and then I remember that the whole studio was based in, in Vilnius, uh, Tallinn, and Riga. So that, you know, five months of research plus someone coming in. But then it's 10 days that you're like, okay, are you going to do it or not? And uh, yeah, yeah, no, but I really think that's why I wanted to explain the whole part of the research because it is very important. And when, when I say research, I think that one word, uh, which is really interesting, I was looking at the other day at master class in my spare time, and uh, it was very interesting. And I, w I looked at S. Devlins, which he's the a set designer, and she said something which was really very much the same idea of, of the research. And she says, it's not actually research, it's search. It's actually search for something that talks to you, right? And I said, oh, that is so beautifully put. I've got to say it somewhere, <laughs> that this idea that it's not just research, but you're searching, you're looking at the material. And then I was looking, 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 and nothing was speaking to me. And then it came, uh, I know it sounds so corny, it came in a dream. But it, it really was like that. I kind of woke up and I said, okay, this is what we got to do. And everybody's like, okay, let's do it. I'm like, we've got 10 days. So we took half an hour. Everybody went to take a coffee. And then we decided, okay, are we doing it or not? Okay, let's do it. Because 10 days, those were a nightmare. Yes, absolutely, 100%. But is it worth it? Yeah, I love it. Did we win? No. All right. But that's another story. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, I love it. Tell me when time is up, though, huh?
just I a can short stay here. question. Oh, I, I have energy to sell, guys. I've been closed in my house for so long. No, I'm joking. Uh, Milano is a little bit better than here. Maybe uh, talking about specifically uh, the Vilnius project, because I'm myself from Vilnius. And did you get any feedback? Because you went against the brief, which I actually can complement that idea, because I'm totally in favor of preserving the existing stru structures. And uh, yeah, did you get by any chance any zero, of course? Yeah. I was very, very surprised because yeah. I thought, I looked at all the competition entries and nobody had kept anything. Everybody had just gone. Which is very sad. Yeah. So I'm like, we're the only ones which have yeah. done this and not even, I was like, give me a mention. No, but I'm seriously, or at least a feedback or something, you know, is this, you guys didn't even think about this. Look at the potential, mm. and that was the idea. Why can we make them? Do, I mean, when you look at it, well, I mean, when I look at the rendering, okay, it's a rendering, but we mm -hmm. had done also a model. It's amazing, amazing what you can yes. do. I mean, and just think that this connected and the sound, and you enter this place, and it feels like Imperial. Yes, from 1918 to today, where's the lit, you know? So for me, nothing, not even one word. Oh, that is very sad. And what about the other proje projects? Because it's not the only project that you went against the brief. No, the Did project in Russia was actually very, uh, very welcome, so much so that they had asked us to do an exhibition, and then COVID hit. And mm -hmm. so we didn't do it. This was in 2019 that they wanted us to, to really present, and I was supposed to go to the forum mm -hmm. and explain the project. Eh? So it was something that was quite welcome, and they really thought it was very interesting. Even if there was a competition, it was won by Hennigan Penn at the time. But it, it, the, our approach that continued and really worked with the whole space and started to engage it had a, had a comeback. And, and we did, uh, like I was mm -hmm. telling you, uh, uh, submitted for the 2001 uh, um, uh, Seoul Biennale, while instead the one about uh, the the bunker, uh, yeah, no. Besides that, it got published in various parts, and and we had uh, some interviews asking us about this project because it was some time ago before things started to get even worse. Uh, but no, we did not have the only one we got feedback was from the Moscow one. Uh, feedback from the actual. Uh, specifically the competition. That was the only one we got feedback further down also the line with the Strelka Institute asking us and things like that. Mm -hmm. But that's that's it, nobody else. Okay. Is that sad? <laughs> yeah, that makes me sad. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> and the, the building yeah. is already destroyed. Huh? The one in no, I know, I saw it's it. Very I saw sad. it, I saw it, I'm like, <laughs> no. So yeah, it's, so, it's I mean, gone. It's not even, so that's the problem. It's not even a discussion anymore, yeah. right? I wasn't even able to start a discussion and someone did ask me but why don't you send it to newspapers you know i mean the minister of culture you know when the other project came said ah oh, this is fantastic we love it yeah it's a completely you take everything away i mean it's very radical to say no i'm going to keep uh, a soviet uh, yeah neoclassical building on top of a hill which is supposed to be the the home of a nation and which you know it's kind of pretty tough to to, to argue that um but yeah no yeah, it's too late now, but uh, <laughs> I still think it's a very interesting project that will, yes. you know, sooner or later will be published uh, when we have everything that I think. It's just because, yeah, it's a pity. Sometimes sometimes I think that unfortunately, like you're saying, Sila, it's, it's not sustainable, therefore not everybody can work on the competition. And of course, for example, I know that in certain offices there were seven people, seven architects working on the competition. And I don't have seven architects to work on the competition. I might have three or four and myself working day and night, but you're not able to arrive to certain times to certain images. Okay, yeah, here we did because we actually got someone to work on them exterior. But, you know, it's really hard to compete uh, for, for these things. Of course, if you'd compete for smaller ones, maybe it'd be, but hey, that's uh, the megalomaniac part. Or, or at least the, the idea that you, you can... It's also that, that, to answer back to the question of, of, of the bigger ones, it's also because if you, an, if you actually do international competitions where there is not only a jury, but the project is big enough and there is enough resonance outside, the message that you're trying to portray is not the small competition, but you're doing it on a bigger you know, forum, 
that hopefully someone, it will reverberate somewhere. So it's, so sometimes I decide to throw the stone in the lake, in the biggest lake, because I say, well, sooner or later, some ripples will come somewhere. If it's in, in the little pond, yes, you might act, it, this is a whole argument. You might say the little pond, you might do it, and then you have something built in that, that's that. Yeah, and it's, it's, I guess it's a choice sometimes to, to, to work also on these big competitions because, you know, maybe something like this could have moved a discussion, could have said, someone could have said, oh, okay, why don't we look into this? I mean, what, someone, right? It's like, uh, it's like vaccinations. There's always someone that could be against it, right? So, I mean, there's always the opposite side, but the opposite side didn't show up. I was the only, I was like, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Well, I admire that uh, concept of yours and uh, Thank best you. of luck being uh, so brave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you.